there are a number of really useful concepts in economics. Sometimes we don't use them, but they can be used for, uh, for society to move forward and to be able to improve. One of the issues with economics and the way we think of economics as a discipline is that we typically just assign this, we, we make it very narrow. We think of it as, yes, linking to financial markets, linking to forecasting, linking to risk, linking to uh, you know, what you meant, uh, profits, and, and that's it. Economics can, be, can, be a, can sometimes be used as a means to narrow our focus, but it can also be used in a really positive way to help us think through really, really difficult issues in a much clearer and um, consistent way. An economic discipline that encourages individualism, an economic framework that does that is not necessarily going to be very helpful. But that, I don't think that necessarily means that global capitalism itself will necessarily collapse. It's most likely to continue in some ways. But it does need adjustment in order to serve people's needs. Well, the way I see economics is that it's a lens of looking at society and how society is structured, but also how it can change. Um, in the same way that uh, if you think of geography, that helps you also understand society. It helps you. So it's just like any of the other, in, in so many other disciplines, it helps us to get a grasp on what society looks like, why it is the way that it is, and in that way, I think that's why it matters. So I find this a really interesting question um, because in my career, so I studied economics, um, as, as you might know, uh, I'm an economist by training. Uh, but I've always wanted, and throughout my career, always tried to bring economics into policy making. And in, in, the, in the way that I just answered the first question about it being a lens, that was how I have used economics in the work I do on international development and also on, um, on uh, climate change issues, to use economics as a means to not just not just you know, play around with spreadsheets or forecasting models, uh, but really bring it into uh, the way that, that policymakers make decisions, understand options, understand the costs of different options uh, of going forward. So I think if they, the idea that there are you know, major differences between you know, economics as an academic, uh, as a academic exercise versus economics as a policy-making um, exercise, I think the more that we bring them together, the more useful it can be. Um, although we do also need to talk, and I think we'll talk about this later, about what economics we're using exactly, what economic frameworks we're using for that. The way I think of economics, uh, if, it is, if it is a lens to look at society, it can serve the common good. That's not always used in that way. And some, sometimes it's used in a way uh, which is, you know, kind of in a sense, almost dictating where society should go. But actually, if it helps us to understand why different people act in the way that they do, or why different situations arise, then I think it can actually serve the common good. And I'll give you a couple of examples. I mean, first of all, um, the idea of, I think there's, there's a couple of key concepts that help us to understand that. First of all, the idea of incentives, why people you know, rationally go and have, have different incentives to act in different ways. That's something which economics gives us a lens on that we don't get from other, other fields. 
we also, from other fields, don't get another concept, which is opportunity cost. And opportunity cost helps us to understand things like, you know, why, for example, we might not, uh, we might not invest in public goods, why we might uh, stop, not actually take uh, advantage of, uh, or, or not realize the issues around climate change or even uh, pandemics. There are a number of really useful concepts in economics. Sometimes we don't use them, but they can be used for, uh, for society to move forward and to be able to improve. Question is whether we use those or not. Right. Okay. again, one of the issues with economics and the way we think of economics as a discipline is that we typically just assign this, we, we make it very narrow. We think of it as, yes, linking to financial markets, linking to forecasting, linking to risk, linking to, uh, you know, what you meant, uh, profits, and, and that's it. Um, I think that is thinking of economics far too narrowly. You know, economics has been around for a very long time. It's a discipline that has been constantly evolving. Um, and there are still many evolutions that it will make. Uh, I worked on something called the Stone Review back in 2006. Um, and it was a study uh, which was recognized globally, um, led by Lord Stern, who was at the time uh, the uh, chief economist for the UK Treasury. And he had a team, including myself, and what we worked on was thinking about the issue of climate change, which had previously been thought of just as a scientific phenomenon. And what we did in that review was look at it as an economic phenomenon. And so what we did for the first time was to look at how much does it cost to take action on climate change versus not take action on climate change. We moved it from, it's gonna cause lots of natural disasters, which we don't see and you know, we're gonna try and do something about, but we don't have to do something about it. You know, we can deal with them when they come along to something which actually, if we don't do it now, it will cost more. That was, that was the fundamental finding of the review. And by doing that, it created a space for a clearer discussion in negotiations, international negotiations about climate change. You know, I then, for example, led work on uh, the, the climate finance negotiations. There were, and it, climate financing was then acknowledged as a real issue in the negotiations that poor countries need to have extra money in order to help them deal with climate change that was not fully acknowledged prior to the Stern Review. So um, it can help us to, un economics can help us to uh, deal with these issues which we might not, uh, which we might not foresee. We also might, uh, which the current way that economies are structured don't deal with very well, but it also, allows us to think of possibilities of structuring societies in a different way, in a way that does deal with these issues. So I think it can be, you know, it can, it, economics can be, can be a, can sometimes be used as a means to narrow our focus, but it can also be used in a really positive way to help us think through really, really difficult issues in a much clearer and um, consistent way. And I think there are certain, um, there are certain really useful examples of that, um, which, which have been done. Um, I think the other, part of, the other part of this as well is, uh, and I'll give you another example in, again in my career uh, in development economics. You know, quite often there's this idea that, you know, people who are poor just need to be helped they make the wrong decisions often and, you know, uh, 
you might wonder why a poor person might go and buy a TV or, <laughs> you know, when they don't, when they can't necessarily put food on the table this week. And those sorts of questions come, come you know, at, at us who work in this development sector. Um, and what develop, what economics can help us do is to not look at poor people necessarily in a way that, in, in a way that kind of situations, situates them as them. We can use economics to understand that they are actually, and, and understand why they're actually acting very rationally if they make those sorts of decisions. And when they do make those sorts of decisions, then that helps us to design programs or policies at a country level, which can then be more helpful towards poor people than, uh, than what we might otherwise do. So again, I think, you know, there are certain disciplines, certain ways, certain concepts uh, within economics that help us do that. And, um, and I, I think it really is just a case of, of its use. Um, typically, we confine ourselves to using too few parts of economics um, and we can do much more. absolutely should be held accountable for their advice. Um, and I think economists should also be held accountable for what kind of economics we're using. There are, you know, there are a number of different types of economic models, economic theories out there. And when we, you know, as an economics kind of discipline, there is there is this idea that there's just one, you know, the Washington consensus, for instance, when it comes to uh, my field of development economics. Um, it's been, you know, recently people have been talking about the Beijing consensus, but that's also equally hard, quite hard to define too. But I think the, you know, when I was, for example, studying develop development economics, uh, we were taught that there were at least six different paradigms of development economics. There was, you know, the capitalist uh, uh, capitalist model of, of development. There was a structuralist model of development, the neo-Marxist model of development, the Mao model of development. There were so, you know, six at least. And when we, at the same time, you know, when we read papers on development economics or look at policies coming out uh, from uh, some of the largest multilateral institutions, uh, whether that's IMF, World Bank, but even the UN, uh, which I worked for for a while. We don't look at, we don't ask, or we should be asking at least, and this is the accountability question, we should be asking, well, what model of development economics are you using? And have you set out what the possible pathways might be if you used a different model? because there is no one model to development. It is, there's non-linearity, uh, you know, the idea that, I actually think one of the most, the least useful concepts in economics is equilibrium. Because, uh, and we often, and many economists, and we're trained to do this, is to use uh, models, general equilibrium models, for forecasting the economy. And what we end up doing is trying to set out a number of parameters, mathematical parameters through which we think the society is going to move and, and the economy is going to move. But the fact is our economy and we, you know, even rationally, we move in very different directions. The economy is dynamic. Um, there are, there's a lot of unpredictability and there's complexity. You know, there's some brilliant books out there um, all about nonlinearity, complexity. Uh, Eric Beinhock is one of my favorite um, authors on that. These are, why are we not consistently referring to these different types of uh, economics when we use them? Um, we, we have, I, I think we actually have to be much more explicit uh, going forwards so that people understand what kind of framework uh, we are, we're in a sense, either being confined to or we're opening ourselves up to. 
I think, um, and I do also think that's why it is some, in some ways helpful to think about um, different, different economies and how they've evolved. Uh, I mentioned Washington consensus and Beijing consensus. Now, you know, while, while certain, uh, certain people will assign Beijing consensus to, to kind of socialist theory and, um, and to communism, uh, part, there are a number of aspects of China's development, which can also be very useful and interesting to think through and link to other types of models of development, which might not necessarily, which are not necessarily associated with governance or, you know, democracy um, or lack of democracy, which is what people tend to think, what some people tend to think of when you say Beijing consensus, they think that's really about governance. But it's not. There are also aspects of, of the economics. If you're looking at African economies, when a government is thinking about how to uh, deal with the agricultural sector, different economic frameworks will give you different answers. One economic framework will say, well, focus on the smallholder farmers, meet, try and meet their basic needs, give them cash. That's a basic needs approach to development. Another model will say, we need to provide fertilizer subsidies and at a massive scale. And we need to even, and subsidize fertilizer, not just through fer subsidizing fertilizer itself, but through subsidizing transport of fertilizer and a whole range of aspects of the economy. That, that's a Chinese Maoist type approach. Um, and, and yet another model will say, we need to have the private sector, big business let's get all the smallholder farmers away from the small farms, make them bigger, agribusiness, bring processing. That's a completely different model as well of economics and economic development. So we need to be explicit. These are different choices. And I think part of the challenge in, and in particular in many of, uh, of the organizations that work on development um, and have you know, an economic uh, department several economists being part of it is we're not explicit about those choices. And when we write things like business cases, which say, you know, what's the impact going to be of this particular program or what's the, how, how, how is it going to help people? We don't say, well, there's all these different types of options for helping people and, um, and, and we're choosing one particular way. There tends to be a kind of a group think around these things and it's important to get out of that. The way that I have thought of these issues before is more the other way around in terms of how much is, or rather how much is economics uh, associated with capitalism? Does it have to be associated with capitalism? Yeah. Um, those are the sorts of questions I, uh, you know, when advising uh, governments or institutions, organizations um, about what type of um, development programs to be taking forward, I guess those are the questions that arise uh, more. How would I define capitalism though? Um, I guess as, as in terms of a focus on the private sector um, as the main as the main uh, driver of uh, economic activity, um, and uh, and as well as a smaller role for government, um, are the things that I think we tend to associate with capitalism. Free market um, would be would be the uh, key concepts. I also think. Some of the most, and as I, was, as I was mentioning before, some of the most challenging aspects or problematic parts of economics, um, equilibrium uh, concepts can be associated with, uh, with capitalism. Um, but we don't, have to, uh, we don't have to associate those things. We don't have to associate economics and capitalism only. Economics can also, also take us into a completely different direction. And economics is used you know, in, in societies that have not, uh, that are not based primarily on the market. 
economics still comes in and helps us to explain what happens in those economies as well. One of the useful things about economics is that it can help us understand why societies collapse. Um, of course, there's other, uh, other, other uh, disciplines that help us to do that. History itself, geography, but economics also helps us to do that. Um, you look at the collapse of slavery as an institution can be associated and explained very well by changes in economic circumstances of the colonial uh, countries versus the colonized countries. And then that becomes a political phenomenon or those things happen together. I don't think it's very easy to separate these things out sometimes, um, but economics helps us to understand um, that collapse. So I think there is no doubt that society will evolve. Um, if that means that global capitalism will collapse, I'm not sure. There are certainly, and I think COVID-19, the pandemic, uh, has demonstrated that uh, certain aspects where you have less government involvement uh, where you have uh, a, a great deal of kind of laissez-faire in a sense, is not necessarily very helpful for, uh, for dealing with these sorts of issues, for dealing with a pandemic where you, have, where you have to be thinking about protecting other people and other people have to be thinking about protecting you. Um, an, economics, an economic discipline that encourages individualism an economic framework that does that is not necessarily going to be very helpful. So, but that, I don't think that necessarily means that global capitalism itself will necessarily collapse. I think it just means it definitely needs, needs to evolve. Um, and if it can evolve, then that would be, then that can, that will, that will move. And I think uh, the means of evolution will be through us you know, as economists and others in other disciplines coming together to think, what can we do next? How do we evolve? How do we understand this crisis? How do we use the information that we got from this crisis to be able to update our thinking and our models, for example, about uh, which countries are better at doing things than others or which types of societies are better at doing things than others? Um, it was very clear, for example, uh, my firm, we started working very early on to track uh, COVID-19 in African economies. And what was very interesting was as we did so, you know, you look at what had been forecast through, you know, very, what felt like very clear frameworks of, well, you know, richer countries will clearly be able to certainly have stronger health systems and you know, certain types of governance, which will mean that they will deal with the pandemic much faster. There was a global preparedness index, which came out just before, literally just before COVID. And the results, and even within African economies, the result was completely different. We found that the countries which were at the bottom of that list were actually the ones that in many, in many cases actually dealt very well with COVID-19 or might have been expected you know, to deal badly and, and it was completely the other way around. That kind of information, we need to reflect on it. It's not just something that we should say, oh, okay, yes, that happened. And just go back to using our old risk models and and thinking of the world in, in that very kind of linear sense of you're rich, therefore you can do everything. No, we need to use that to look at, well, what, what was wrong with those frameworks? What was wrong with those indices? And how do we adjust them? And how do we then have, you know, the countries that did do well, even if they were poorer, how do they share lessons with others? 
And that's actually also something that economics can help us to do. We can look at the economic, we can use economic models to do that. There's no reason why we can't. We just need to adjust them with the appropriate information. That, that, that's, uh, that's actually very interesting. Before uh, I, Fabio goes into question eight, I just wanted to, uh, you, you're getting into resilience. There were maybe things in these societies we didn't pick up on how resilient they were. I have a colleague at McGill uh, who teaches econ economics, econometrics, and he works a lot in resilience as does William Hines at the OECD. And he makes a point when he always talks about resilience, he makes a point growing up in, in you know, rural Eastern Canada in New Brunswick when he was a child, uh, when the power went out, because they had just put a grid in when he was a kid. And when the power went out, well, they were still in an era where every house had an underground pantry. So when the power went out, you didn't lose all your food. In fact, it was a minor inconvenience. Whereas today, today we're much less resilient in that way because if the power goes out, we're completely cut off. Um, in everything, refrigeration, but also from communication. And so while we're richer today in, in some aspects, we're not resilient to certain shocks. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that in. Well, absolutely. And I think, you know, that was in a way for African countries as well. That was one of the one of the interesting aspects of COVID-19, especially at the beginning. Um, the fact that Africa is quite um, is quite delinked from the rest of the world uh, in many ways. It accounts for something like 2% of, uh, of global foreign direct investment, 4% of trade, so, and tourism similarly. So that, when it came to COVID, actually gave African countries a great deal of time compared to a number of other destinations and a number of other regions, a great deal of time to plan ahead and see what others were doing and to be able to say okay well that looks like a, a good strategy that doesn't look like such a great strategy and so we will adjust um and so it's that and it's not resilient and it's not necessarily uh uh, uh not something we'd recommend to be kind of separated from the rest of the world that's not what african economies want to be but um at least you know the that, that, that fact, again, is something that is worth bearing in mind that because of the way that the world economy is structured right now, that is something that you might want to factor into, uh, into how you forecast preparedness for a global pandemic, which we hadn't before. And we might think about how to change that, of course, but Absolutely. when we do, we also know what we lose. So imagining is, is key to what, um, what I do and what I care about. My firm is called Development Reimagine. <laughs> um, and the reason being that I, the reason being that our current system does need reimagining. It isn't serving a number of people, a lot of people. Uh, we have over 400, over 400 million people in African countries who are under the poverty line. And that's a very low poverty line at 1.9 US dollars a day. Uh, we have problems of climate change. Uh, we've got plans to, you know, deal with climate change through climate finance, but the finance trickles through aid money is reducing uh, from, from large economies. We have uh, other large economies trying to support, but they also face those challenges too. And we effectively have really poor distribution across the world, poor distribution of finance, um, poor distribution um, of uh, of what should, what should be the benefits of, of growth, what should be the benefits of capitalism as it were. So 
there is no reason why we can't continue to why, why capitalism shouldn't uh, should not necessarily um, continue. It's it's most likely to continue in some ways, but it does need adjustment in order to serve people's needs. Now, some people argue for degrowth, say that uh, we need to completely get away, get away from the idea of growth and economic growth. I'm not one of those people. Um, I do think it really is about how we, how we use frameworks to distribute growth and target it to the right places in order for people to benefit. And I think economics actually helps us to do that. There are su such important concepts, public goods, the concept of a public good, externalities. These are concepts which if we really thought, it, the concept of a public good helps you to think about the role of government. And the idea that, for example, you can leave a transport system just to the private sector to deal with, or you can't, or you, you, you might just not, you might just not regulate it, or, you know, and for developing countries, there were, there were certain models back in the 1980s to come out of, of a debt crisis, 1980s and 90s called structural adjustment. And that was trying to get countries to privatize a lot of uh, a lot of their uh, of their these activities, these government what were previously government activities that government was spending money on. If we really thought about public goods and really understood that concept, that wouldn't be we wouldn't we wouldn't have gone that way. And in fact, those sorts of uh, those sorts of programs, which did encourage that privatization, they led to a lot more poverty. There's evidence that they led to a lot more poverty than they would have done because they didn't use these core concepts. Now, I don't think capitalism means that we can't, we can't have these concepts, but we do, we should be really bringing, bringing to the fore some of the concepts that we constant, that we often forget or that have just kind of been downplayed over the last few years uh, in economics and use those to think about a reimagined reimagined society which does distribute better and does provide for the poorest in society within countries and, and across the world. I think it's possible. Mm -hmm.